Hello everyone, my name is Deepthi and today our topic of presentation is IMDS which is International Material Data System. So under this topic I plan to take you through some of the basic uh, introduction about IMDS, about the ELV or the end of life vehicle directive, about some recyclability and recoverability topics and uh, some of the prerequisites to start IMDS and what are the IMDS activities of an OEM or a tier one and what we do in this activity at Chem Advisor. So to start with, as I said, this is a basic definition of IMDS, a material data system used to implement the directive of end of life of vehicles. And the automobile industry's material data system, all materials used for automobile manufacturing are collected, maintained, analyzed, and archived in the system. It's a joint development of Audi, BMW, and some of the major OEMs, and then joined by further manufacturers in the later years. It's a global standard used by almost all the global OEMs. Using IMDS, it is possible to meet the obligations placed on automobile manufacturers and thus on their suppliers by national and international standards, laws and regulations. So colloquially, IMDS is frequently used as a synonym for ELV or End of Life of Vehicle Directive. So in the next slide, I show you a screenshot of all the OEMs. So these are all the OEMs that are involved in the International Material Data System. So you can see the main ones there, the big ones like the Honda, Volvo, Renault, Nissan. So this is just a screenshot from the International Material Data System web page. And so in this slide, this is how the system looks like when we log into the system in a website like www.mdsystem.com. And uh, this is how, this, uh, how the, the home page of the system looks like. And if you have an, if you're an existing user, you can log into the system. And if you're a new person, you can go and read some details about the system. So this is how the system looks like in web. So HP is the operating, HP is the one who is operating the international material data system. So I told you in the initial slide about um, IMDS is the, uh, is the tool to, uh, to manage the end of life vehicle directive. So before going to the end of life vehicle directive, I would say something about uh, end of life of vehicle. What is an end of life of vehicle? So that is an ELV and ELV is basically any vehicle that has come to the end of its useful life. And there are two types of ELVs, natural ELVs and premature ELVs, as the name implies. Natural ELVs refers to a vehicle that has come to the end of its life due to natural wear and tear, usually vehicles over 10 years old. And premature ELVs, this type of ELV refers to those vehicles that have come to the end of their life for some unnatural reasons, such as accident or fire or flood or some damage. So these are the two types of ELVs. And now I go to the slide which explains about the background of ELV directive and how this directive came into effect. So this end of life of vehicles usually generates between 8 to 9 million tons of waste in the community annually. So after use, the cards are shredded for recovery of materials and the remaining residue or automotive shredder residue or ASR represents around 25% of the initial weight of the car of which one third is plastics. So this is a huge number and this is a great threat to the environment. So the French car industry backed by the Ministries of Environment and the industry signed on March 10, 1993 a framework agreement progressively reduced the quantities of ASR to about, you know, from the 25 percentage to about 15 percentage in 2005 and 5 percentage in 2015 and by setting up waste recovery installations. And the ELV directive was published in the year of 2007, aiming at a recoverability rate of 95 percentage and a reusability or recyclability rate of 85 percentage by 2015. So these are the basic aims of ELV directive, making vehicle dismantling and recycling more environmentally friendly, preventing the use of certain heavy metals such as cadmium, lead, mercury, and hexavalent chromium, set some targets for reuse, recycling, and recovery of vehicles and their components, pushes producers to manufacture new vehicles with a view to their recyclability. So these are the main aims of the directive. And I have used the word vehicle many times. So by the term vehicle, it doesn't, it doesn't cover all the type of vehicles. So it has a specific meaning. 
in the ELB directive. So it is the vehicle means any vehicle designated as category AM1 or AN1 or the three wheel motor vehicles as defined in directive 92 slash 61 slash EEC. It excludes motor vehicles, motor tricycles, sorry. So category M1 is that kind of vehicles that are used for the carriage of passengers and comprising no more than eight seats in addition to the driver's seat. And category N1, vehicles used for the carriage of goods and having a maximum weight not exceeding 3.5 metric tons. So the last slides were about ELV, about IMDS, about the ELV, how the ELV directive came into effect and what are the aims of the ELV directive. So as I said about ELV directive, aim it has an aim of recyclability and recoverability to achieve 95 percentage and 85 percentage respectively so by and that's the target date is uh, 2015 so there is an iso standard iso 22628 which defines the calculation of the potential mass fraction of a vehicle which can be recycled is equal to recyclability and or can be recovered that is recoverability so as I said about recycling and recovery, that's the definition for these two processes. Recycling is a reprocessing step of waste materials for the original purpose or for other purposes, excluding the processing but as a means of generating energy. And recovery is almost the same thing, but it includes the processing as a means of generating energy. So. <clears throat> So, as I said, there is an ISO 22628 standard to calculate the recyclability and recoverability. So, the calculation of recyclability and recoverability rates is carried out through the following four steps on a new vehicle for which the component parts, materials, or both can be taken into account at each step. There are several steps like this, pre-treatment, dismantling, metal separation, non-metallic residue treatment. So, if I explain something about pre-treatment step, in the pre-treatment step, usually uh, the, the parts like all fluids, batteries, oil filters, or catalytic converters, converters, excuse me, these are taken into account. Example, the dismantling step. In the dismantling step, certain other of the vehicle's reusable and recyclable component parts may be taken into account based on the following like dismantability, accessibility, and proven dismantling technology. So, so these steps account for some parts or materials that can be taken from the car and can be recycled or recovered. So we have a formula to calculate the rates. And as you see for the recoverability rate, there is an extra MTE in addition to the recyclability rate. That's what the definition says. Recoverability rate has something to do with the energy, energy recovery. So that accounts for that MTE and this calculated values this should be like 85% and 95% respectively. If it doesn't meet this target, the vehicles may not be able to put on the market and they cannot be shipped or imported to European Union. So these are the formulas as per ISO 22628. And uh, to remind you, these are the activities or calculations to, to be done by an original equipment manufacturer or a car manufacturer, not by a tier one supplier who supplies some parts to the car manufacturers because this recyclability and recoverability rate is to be done on the entire vehicle and this is to be done by the original equipment manufacturers. So these are all the uh, details about IMDS, about ELV, about the aims, about the recyclability and recoverability targets and how do we calculate that. And now I show you a, a diagram which helps you to understand how the IMDS data flow how the IMDS data collection flow, what is the IMDS data collection flow concept? So as I said in the previous slides, like HP is the IMDS database manager, they manages the system. So they have loaded all the substances that are in the materials of different kinds of materials. So as you can see in the bottom level, uh, like lead or cellulose or PVC, copper, iron, and all these substances are loaded in the system. And these substances make up the materials. The materials make up the components and the semi-components. And the components make up the assemblies and the sub-assemblies. So if you are a tier two supplier and you are supplying to a tier one supplier, and the tier one supplier can add some parts to your part and then make a big part and then submit to the 
OEM. So finally, it reaches the OEM and they accept or reject the part. If they reject the part, there should be some reason that they reject the part because of some non-compliance with the regulations. So then we have to rework and we have to see what we have done wrong and then resubmit the part. So this is how the data flows from the substance level to the assembly level till the OEM. And this is like the prerequisites to start the IMDS system. So if you are a company who is going to supply some parts to European Union, to a company located in European Union, so you need to comply with this directive and then you need to use this international material data system. So then you need to register your company in the database. The IMDS allows to register a company online and a contact person and a company administrator for the company need to be defined during the online registration. And then you, you would probably have a bill of material because bill of material is what is the part is actually is. It has a basic information like the parent part number, child part numbers, quantity, supplier names and levels at which the child is linked to the parent part. And then you would probably have the contact details also of all the suppliers that supply the parts to you. And then you need to have a library of OEM IMDS guidelines and hazardous substance standards of all the OEMs or tier suppliers with whom the, your company is working with. Because there are lots of OEMs, there are lots of tier 1 and tier 2 suppliers. So if you supply a part to them, you need to know uh, the, the regulations or the IMDS regulations or the IMDS guidelines that they follow. They have some specific requirements and they, they follow some specific requirements and then you need to know them so that your part gets accepted by them. So these are the basic things that you need to have, you need to have when you have to start an IMDS activity in your company. <clears throat> Going to the next uh, slide, these are the IMDS activities with an OEM and a tier N supplier. It can be tier 1 or tier 2 or tier 3. So some of the basic activities that an IMDS team or an IMDS person or an IMDS expert does. So this is IMDS validation according to the ELV and other IMDS recommendations. And then there is a follow-up for the unreported parts and the non-compliant parts. Then there is a creation of the MDS. And then there is a tracking of non-compliant parts and unreported MDS, tracking of parts according to some REACH regulations or some other associated requirements like a PBDE or a PBB check or a lead check or a lead and solder check. Yeah. And then data submission from suppliers to customers and then calculation of recyclability and recoverability rate according to ISO 22628. So the last step is basically very much for the OEM, not for the tier ones. So this one is the ELV management, the entire process. So it starts from the design phase and then the IMDS compliance, then to RRR calculations, and then the ELV, that is at the authorized treatment facilities. The vehicles are at the treatment facilities and after the end of their life. So basically the IMDS operation, IMDS activities basically covers the, the two in the middle, like IMDS compliance and then RRR calculations. And some of the companies do extended, extend to other departments like the design also being aligned with this IMDS operations and some companies uh, um, link the IMDS operations with the ELV treatment facilities as well. So, but these are the basic uh, operations in the entire ELV management. So having explained all these things about IMDS and ELV, I take you to a slide where what we do at Chem Advice and what are our strengths in this field. So the basic thing, the basic and the most important uh, thing is that we have got a core domain expertise in this um, ELV and IMDS. So we have resources who have reviewed more than 100,000 data sheets and submitted more than 100,000 data sheets to OEMs as well as tier ones. And we have a good expertise in industry in the PLM databases. PLM databases are the product lifecycle management databases. These databases help uh, for the IMDS activities and over 17,000 man hours. So this, this, is, this is really good one. And then expertise in an upgraded versions of IMDS tools. There are so many tools to help with the IMDS operations. Like I showed you the IMDS system, 
we are in we log into the system that's a general www.mdsystem.com so now there are many tools in the market in the industry which helps in the easy access to the system which helps in the easy evaluation of the data sheets which helps in the easy submission of the data sheets so uh, these are some of the tools and we have expertise in these tools and we have varied engineering backgrounds like chemical polymer toxicology materials which also helps and we have OEM as well as tier N experience. Like we have worked with OEMs and we have resources who worked with tier one. So they know both the process, the OEM process, the, the basic process is the same, but at the same time, there is some additional activities for the OEM, like the recyclability recoverability calculations that I said earlier. So we have experience in both these um, OEM as well as tier one or tier N suppliers. So I think this would be the last slide and these are some of the main challenges that the suppliers face in this ELV act or IMDS activities and we have solutions to these challenges. So one of the challenges like a varying requirements from different customers or OEMs. So, you know, there are a lot of OEMs and there are a lot of customer uh, tier some suppliers. So they have different requirements. There is a basic requirement, which is the IMDS requirement, but they have there are specific to each company. There will be some specific requirements. So they are so quite varying, and it confuses many of the suppliers how to comply with these requirements. And sometimes the OEM guidelines are a bit difficult to understand, and there can be rejections from the OEMs. Like we submit a part to them and that component is being rejected by them because of some reason which you don't understand. So it needs a lot of reading and IMDS guidelines and many recommendations to get the part accepted by the OEM. And the language barriers, like there are a lot of suppliers located throughout the world in Europe, Asia and America. So if you have to talk to a supplier in Thailand or in Greece, the chem advisor speaks your language because we have experts from different different countries who speak the native language. So that's the solution to that problem. And then suppliers unaware of the IMDs or the ELV requirements and, and we have to teach them a little bit. Uh, we have to guide them what to be done so that our parts get compliant and get submitted to the OEM on time. So these are some of the main challenges and the solution. We have the solution to this. I think this takes us to the end of the slides. So this is a reference, some references where you can go and refer about ELB and IMDS, which gives you some information about the guidelines, about what to be done, about the about the threshold limits, about the timelines, and yeah. Okay, and if you have any questions now, I'm more than happy to answer that. Thank you.